get more familiar with the symbology, you start to be able to weave it in. Just like when you're doing something like reading Tarot or doing geomantic divination, you get the symbols and you start to work with them and you get the feeling of how they come together along with your intuition. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but if you're interested, yes, there are formulas on just exactly how to add up the planets and all the rest of it. Uh, see the work of Lee Lehman, Classical Astrology for Modern Living. I think she has in that, one of her essays in that book. Okay. Now, let's take a quick look here. Okay. This is one of my favorite parts. It's only two pages from the book. <clears throat> you're conducting a seminar that begins at 8.30 a.m., following an 8 a.m. coffee and donut session. When you arrive at 7.45 a.m., the first participant is already seated in the room with no pad and pencils lying in front of her. She says nothing until you approach, and then she politely shakes hands. She's totally noncommittal. You ask a few questions and receive polite, short answers. About that description. Around 8.15, several other people in the room, a person stops hesitantly at the door and softly asks, excuse me, is this a training seminar for salespeople? When he hears yes, breathes a sigh, walks in, takes a cup of coffee, mentions how interesting and helpful, hopes the seminar will be, asks a few questions, and listens intently to others' remarks. He expresses some concern about role-playing in front of a group. At this moment, another participant strides in and asks, hey, is this the sales seminar? I'm told yes. Person dramatizes relief, asks for coffee, and explains that he can't function without that black poison. He's overheard the comments about role playing and leaps in on a conversation of how much he likes doing those things. After this remark, he goes on with a tale of how embarrassed himself in the last role play session he attended. Now, do you get a sense of, gee, maybe you could figure out the styles of these people. The first person, disinterest in conversation, restrained gestures. Yeah, indirect in this term. So this narrows down to a relator, or thinker, these are the labels they use. Clearly in control of her emotions and the setting makes her self-contained as opposed to open. Boom, melancholic type. Second person, soft voice, requests clarification, hesitates. All these add up to indirect, thinker or relator. Volunteers information about personal feelings. Boom, phlegmatic. Participant three, directness, speed of responses, fast movements, High quantity of conversation. Direct shows open behaviors by telling stories and responding quickly. Socializer. Is this starting to make sense here? Okay. So you see that I, at great expense and difficulty, um, put basically this down here at the bottom of your uh, <laughs> at the bottom of your chart too, because I didn't want to use graphic software and just took a picture. Okay. <laughs> So this gives you a little bit in how these things fit together. Now, Timothy Leary, to look at our last part here. Timothy Leary was not the acid king of the 60s all of his life. He was um, actually conceived on the day that prohibition was repealed. And, uh, was actually in, I think it was military academy before he went and did something else. And as he said, he was on track to become, you know, the standard neurotic psychology professor. Except he did some brilliant work. He did uh, a, a whole study of interpersonal behavior, came up with a test. And what was really interesting about it was um, it became very popular very quickly. It was based on a work of a psychiatrist named Sullivan was good enough to get him to become a Harvard professor. Hey, top of the heap. And then somebody gave him a mushroom. <laughs> okay. Totally changed his life. Started him looking at psychedelics and the theory of imprinting, which was at that point really popular. A guy named Conrad Lorenz had talked about it and gotten a bunch of baby geese to follow him. and. Uh, gotten another goose to imprint on a, on a basketball, I think it was, so it was sexually attracted to any round object and things like that. Um, that, that there are these critical periods in a person's life. And if things happen in those periods, it, it's like a stamp that leaves an imprint on you. Well, 
he came up with this test and that was really cool and then he wound up experimenting with LSD. He did research on prisoners and actually had them do mushroom trips and saw whether they could be re-imprinted. And for a period of time, their recidivism rate dropped. Their lives had changed for a period of time. Long-term results were not as good. Uh, we don't know what would have happened if they would have done a series of trips, maybe interspersed in time or something, or if it would have been part of a more integral kind of therapy. Um, in the early 60s, a lot of people were doing LSD research. I actually got to meet uh, and, and work with Dr. Robert Masters. Anybody remember him? Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, okay? With his wife, Jean Houston. Um, Bob did a lot of stuff with LSD. He, was, he made his first part of his career as being an expert in um, sex and human behavior. And then he moved into altered states of consciousness. Uh, Bob was actually friends with Milton Erickson the great modern hypnosis, uh, hypnotherapist. And he was friends with Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson and told me about what Alan Watts was like and how everyone thought that he was so off there and, and sitting there quietly by himself in the corner at parties and how everyone thought that he was so intense when actually he was drunk on his ass. <laughs> and Bob didn't think too much about him. By the way, we have time for a little aside. This is my favorite story. I had lunch with Bob once, and I said, well, what's your favorite story about Milton Erickson? And he said, well, you know, I tried to interest Erickson in um, my, um, my research in LSD and everything, but he was really kind of bored in the conversation. Finally, I was talking to him, and I said, hey, you've done something about uh, phantom limb pain, haven't you? And Erickson had treated phantom limb pain with hypnosis. In fact, he had suggested phantom limb pleasure to somebody and gotten some very interesting changes. And he said, yes, I have. He says, well, one of the things that I do as a sexologist in New York is I'm one of the few people that can clear someone to have um, a sex change surgery. And Erickson said, yes. He said, well, one of the interesting things is uh, when they go from male to female, okay, there are no phantom penises. And so Bob told me that they spent about a half hour at that point talking about phantom penises, which I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that conversation and the ins and outs of you know the neurology of it and, and psychological attachment and all the rest. I thought that was this one little gem that I, I gleaned aside from some of other uh, of Dr. Master's work, which if you ever get a chance to learn his psychophysical method, it's absolutely amazing. In any case, um, so Leary was out there and doing this LSD research and everything and then got political about it and got kicked out of Harvard along with uh, Richard Alpert, who later became Baba Ram Dass, if you remember him, okay? Wonderful guy, I got to hug him once after a lecture. It was really quite nice. Um, he sort of infected me with a mantra that kept with me for 20 minutes or so. And uh, Leary then had a whole series of adventures. Now, one of the great things about Leary's adventures was that he was always thinking and keeping on top of things. At one point, he was arrested in California for I think it was <coughs> half of a marijuana cigarette. He was given, I think it was 15 years in prison. But one of the interesting things that happens is, in California, they give you a series of psychological tests before you uh, are put in prison. Guess what one of the tests was? What he designed. <laughs> what he designed, the Leary Interpersonal <laughs> Dynamics of Personality Test. Now, Leary took this thing and chopped it into 16 pieces. He has four per quadrant. So if you're more in this section, you are slightly dominant, but more on the friendly side. If you're over here, you are very dominant and slightly friendly. You see how? So where do you think Leary came out on his test? Second mm -mm. Uh, Where would you want prison very, officials very to think? Yeah. Very friendly. Extremely submissive mm -hmm. and just slightly friendly. So where did they put him? Minimum security prison. 
and he broke out and went to Algeria with the help of the Black Panthers. <laughs> Later went to Switzerland and he was kidnapped by the CIA, I think, and brought back to the country and then mysteriously pardoned. We're not sure quite how that happened. But here's the thing. Leary had this theory. Have people heard of the eight circuits? Okay. Anybody here read Robert Anton Wilson? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had... I, I, actually, I, I have some connections with him. Have you read the Illuminatus Trilogy? Okay. When, when I first came to Chicago, um, I was staying with some friends of mine, and right above me was this guy by the name of Neil. And Neil I had seen around at science fiction conventions. Little did I know that Neil was the template for a fellow by the name of Simon Moon. <laughs> So when I first came to Chicago, I lived in the apartment under Simon Moon, one of the characters from the Illuminatus trilogy. And as another little aside, you remember that a little while ago there was a new planet that was found, Eris? Okay. Neil sent me an, a, um, yeah, it's the next one out from Pluto. They, they, they called it Xena at first uh, for the warrior princess, but then they renamed it Eris because it was such a controversy. Is it a full planet? Is Pluto a full planet? And no, these are considered... Uh, plant, minor planets or something planetoids like, or something. planetoids or something, it was a new class. And so because of all the strife, they named it Eris. But here was the ultimate cosmic joke. My friend Neil sent me an astrological chart which he had gotten off the internet, which showed where Eris was. It was conjunct his moon. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was just wonderful. In any case, in, in, in case you hadn't figured out, Aside from collecting religions, I also collect interesting people along the way. It's an absolute blast to, you know, to, to ask me later and I'll tell you all about Oberon South. In any case, um, the thing was, he, Robert Anton Wilson worked a lot with um, Leary and was very influenced by his theories of the stages. Now, what Leary talked about was the oral bile survival circuit Right? Is the world friendly? Can I get what I want or not? And the anal territorial circuit, can I take charge of my area or not? So these first two dimensions, which Leary mapped out in his, in his circuit theory, were actually based on some of, on this test that he did, okay? Which Wilson then ran with, which by the way, if you read um, uh, Prometheus Rising, uh, the diagram that Wilson has in there is incorrect. Two of the things are switched around. Okay, but in any case, um, so this all interconnects. So it, it's all really nice that Leary did all of that. This basic four quadrants, okay, was some of the basis for Leary's test. So what we have here is we have the four elements. They contribute to the theory of the four humors. They influenced the zodiac in our theory of the zodiac. Later on, it was rediscovered by William Marston, who invented the lie detector and came up with Wonder Woman from some of his ideas on dominance and submission and what women should really be like, okay? then morphed again into interpersonal theory, which Leary used, okay? At the same time, someone took up Marston's stuff and said, hey, we could make a lot of money consulting to business on this. Came up with disc theory, okay? And Leary uses his test to break out of prison, and <coughs> there are still some people using the Leary test, all right? So what we have is these basics, even the principles of hot, cold, wet, and dry, coming all the way from how many thousands of years ago to modern times. Simply our understanding and some of the labels change a bit, which I think is wonderful. It's great to see how these things interconnect the patterns, you know? So yeah, that's kind of a wet statement, okay? <laughs> But you can also make a dry statement to pull out okay, the particulars of how these things happened and what are the little pieces of it, okay? 
So each of these, of course, has their own strengths. And, and this book, People Smarts, as well as any, any DISC book, will tell you of some of the strengths, what's a leader like in any of these four dimensions. Because you can have a leader who's down here, you know, or, or melancholic. You know, I've run things, even though I bitch and complain all the way through. These ones will have different ways of interacting, which gives me my final point before I give you time to take the Leary test yourself, which you have in your handout. Leary found that there is a reflexive relationship across this horizontal line. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of this, but think about it. Like I said, the psychotic who's in the padded room, you throw in a kitten, he's going to jump to being friendly and taking care of the kitten. You get the alley cat, get stuff thrown at it because it's down here in this passive aggressive and brings out the aggressive part. You get the really big bouncer in the bar and no one messes with him because they get into the submissive part and they're a little scared of him. Okay? Except if you get to know him, maybe you'd want him walking down an alley with you. Okay? In the same way, you get politicians like Reagan or Obama, the friendly leader types, and they bring out the friendly follower types. This is another part of the phlegmatic. Or you get politicians who are fearful, but they say they'll lead you away from the fear, getting fearful followers, like in the recent Bush administration with terrorism and changing the terror threat all the time. And you look at the dynamics of things like the Transportation Safety Authority, okay? They're trying to make people feel that it's secure by spending all this money and going through all your bags. When the, there are two things, actually another person that I know is Bruce Schneier, who's um, like one of the authorities on, on uh, cryptography as well as uh, safety and security. And he says basically there's two things that make people more secure on the airplanes. You know what they are? The cockpit doors are reinforced, and now the passengers know they can fight back. The metal detectors and all the rest of it is, is crap. It's theater. Yeah, it's theater. Security theater. That's, that's the phrase that he put together. You know? But it's theater which has people following along. Okay? So you can see these dynamics happen all the time in all these different things. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do this test, and then I'll tell you how to score it. Now, I would like to discuss, is there a reciprocal sure. relationship horizontally as well? You know, um, that's something that I've thought about for a while, and some of the books will talk about what these different types, um, how they get along with each other. Mm -hmm. But I think if the types are well expressed and if they understand these things, they get along. Usually, um, these guys do fairly well because they understand leadership. You know? so right, you can touch it. Yeah. Legendarily, right? Right, right. And I think these guys, because they are submissive, they have a general sense of things, too. You know? But, you know, the friendly leader will bring out the melancholic, will go, okay, they'll take charge, and they seem nice enough, and I'm safe with them. Mm -hmm. So the interrelationship between the four, I think, is a little bit more complex and interesting, except that we do know that there's this reflexive relationship, which is pretty strong. Okay. It feels like there's some interesting stuff about resistance. Um, some Hitler, mm -hmm. top left, right? Mm -hmm. Choleric, extreme mm -hmm. choleric. Mm -hmm. um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. who's friendly and somewhat dominant, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Unwilling to be pushed under and pushed down. Well, look at Gandhi, he'd religion. be in the upper right. Yeah. Yeah, just because you're a friendly leader doesn't mean that you're a pushover, exactly. especially, you know. Exactly. So perhaps there's something there about, you know, in, if you're looking at a, at a system that is too much in one quadrant, led by a leader that's dragging things off, the political resistance in that space is the horizontal the opposite. Interesting idea. idea. Yeah, yeah. But see, here's the thing. You know, when I, when I was doing medical social work for about 20 years, I was working in the hospitals. And I worked with folks, um, I, I worked with uh, new uh, students, you know, uh, student interns. One of the first things I did was I taught them this. Mm -hmm. 
because it's really handy for you know sussing out where's the patient. Most patients are going to be forced into the submissive. You know, think about it. You go to the hospital, they give you a name tag and a wristband, they take your pants, you know, <laughs> you're put into this submissive role. And you know, you're a, you're a good patient if you're submissive. If you ask too many questions, if you keep the doctor too long, you know, or like my patient that I, that I praised, I said, you know, look, you have a right to know what's going on. And she, the doctor came in and said, well, you're gonna have this and such surgery tomorrow. And she said, no, I'm not. He said, what? You haven't told me all about it. I wanna know what's going on. Well, now they have rules about informed consent, but right. sometimes they still don't follow them. Like my hypnosis training, I was with a friend of mine for her birth, and the nurse came in and said, well, you have to have the Pitocin. It's a hospital policy. And I said, if you're gonna be that unethical, we're gonna walk against medical advice. She shut up. <laughs> she also told my godson that he really should be a good boy. He didn't wanna to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Filipino Roman Catholic nurse. In any case, oh, one other thing, yeah, from that time. I ran into a guy in the hospital, he was up here. All the nurses were scared of him. The doctor said, Alan, you better go and see, I forget what his name was, Doug or something. Uh, you know, he's scaring all the nurses. I walk in and I see a guy who I can tell from his posture and his body shape, okay, uh, because of some of my other training in body-centered therapy, he was over here on this side. But he was really angry, so at least temporarily he was up here. So I asked him, hi, what's happening? He's like, and he grouses about this and that and, and public aid and all the rest. So from my training, I know, okay, I could be the really nice guy, but I'm gonna get more respect from this guy if I match him. So I went, yeah, you know, I, get, I have to deal with those bastards in public aid all the time. I gotta get them on the phone and all the rest, you know? So I grouse back with him for a little bit. And I said, you know, part of the reason why I'm here is, you know, on cancer floor, I want to make sure you get your rights, you know? And one of the things that I think would be really good for you here is we can designate with this power of attorney for health care, you know, who would be able to um, make decisions for you so you really get what you want, even if, you know, you're out of it. We give you, say we give you the wrong medicine and you're, you're passed out for a bit, you know? Now, the nice thing about this, too, is even when you croak, the person can take care of you know, your funeral needs and stuff. And he went, well, that's a nice way of putting it, croak. And I shifted. And I went, let's see. Down here, I think, is, you can describe it. I changed my voice tone and I said, look, I know if I was sitting right there, I'd be really scared myself. The thing you have is a life and death fight. And I don't want to pull any punches, but I want you to get your rights too. He started to cry. So you can start to look and see. He find, you know, I was able to lead him into the point where, yeah, he was able to see that he was scared too, and a lot of this was the bluster, you know. So a lot of you are in positions where you're going to be doing counseling with people and such. These are things to keep in mind. Okay, where is the person? Can you lead them somewhere? You know, what, how can you match where they're at and lead them to another experience? What's the circumstance that they're in and are they feeling powerless or are they, I've got to hang on and take control, okay? Very basic things that you can kind of get at least a little idea of from this, okay? Now, let me tell you about the Leary test. Um, most people don't read the top directions and they think that because there are four in each little section they have to choose, please don't, <laughs> okay? Look at each one of the words and just check it if it thinks, if you think it fits you. Ignore the lines. So, you know, well thought of, always giving advice, often admired, tries to be too successful. If one of those fits you, check it. If all of them fit you, check it, okay? So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to go through this. There are 128 of them and then I'll show you how you actually score this little sucker, okay? And you can see where your own personal mix is. Sound good? Sure. All right, let's take you know, five or 10 minutes. I'll just, just look up when you're done, all right? And then we'll talk about how Leary's chart is used.
and we'll finish up and I'll take any questions. Give me a chance to drink this water, which I still have.